It was 2008. My family lived in rural Nevada, and my dad was a hunting guide and convinced my mom to move up to Alaska. We made the 3,000-mile drive along the Alaskan Highway through Canada, spending a particularly large amount of time enjoying the Yukon Territory. We had three vehicles, all large trucks with trailers full of stuff. If you've driven along the Alaskan Highway, there are lots of very large rest areas. My dad built an enclosure atop his tailgate of the truck and built a room with windows in it so my brothers and I could hang out and not be strapped into a seat the whole drive. My dad, being an avid hunter, had some real trouble getting his 30-plus guns through customs into Canada, but once we were cleared, he kept a 500 caliber revolver, bare protection, in the cab with him. It was so late, I don't know what time, but was incredibly dark outside, and we stopped at a rest stop somewhere outside of the Laird Hot Springs, British Columbia area. Give or take 50 miles. I was young. We were all asleep when all of a sudden we heard several gunshots coming from inside the cab of the truck. My mom was hysterical and the other driver of the other vehicle was outside with a shotgun. My dad and he approached the edge of the cleared rest area and all I could see was a very dense wall of trees. I didn't get to see it, but when they had parked the lights were on and illuminating the wall of forest. My dad was just looking ahead when all of a sudden he realized an immensely large figure was standing perfectly still, just at the edge of the tree line. He didn't notice it, though, until it stepped towards our truck. He recalls its eyes being incredibly green, and the reflection of the headlights made its eyes almost glow. My mom and the other driver's girlfriend were in the porta potty just to the left of the trucks, so my dad immediately pulled out the revolver and started shooting. As he was terrified, the figure was going towards the porta potties. After the first shot was fired, he said he'd never seen an animal react so fast and with such ease. I think about this night a lot and figured I'd get the story out there. Some extras. It was not a bear whatsoever. My dad had been a seasonal traveling hunting guide for a few years at this point and had bagged several bears from black to brown to grizzly. We've driven that road several times since this night as we've been back and forth between Alaska and Nevada for years and have not had another encounter. Still gives me insane chills, though. In late September 1962, my three friends and I, all hailing from Chicago, were on our way back to the Twin Lakes cottage our parents had rented for the month. We had just returned from a visit to Grand Haven, where we'd gone to witness the grand opening of a musical fountain. The drive had taken us about two hours, and at this point we were roughly 15 minutes away from reaching Twin Lakes. We were navigating along Dewey Lake Street, the bumpy gravel road that meandered between a swamp on the eastern side of Dewey Lake Road. As we slowed down on this narrow, winding gravel path, our car's headlights suddenly illuminated something that caught our attention. My friend Randy Imes pointed out what appeared to be a colossal tree right in the middle of the road. The sight was quite perplexing. Our driver, Terry Jones, decided to stop the car, unsure of how to proceed. It was at this moment that the tree did something wholly unexpected. It turned around to face us, Terry later described the creature as towering over us, standing directly in our path. Then, in a remarkably nonchalant manner, it started walking over towards the swamp on the north side of Dewey Lake Road and vanished into the darkness. The girls in the car with us were screaming loudly, and it didn't stop until we were almost back at the cottage. Jones recalled, I was genuinely worried about how to get past that thing, so I didn't stop but I distinctly remember seeing it walk away into the swamp, disappearing into the darkness. Randy, I was added, I really wanted to go back the next day in daylight, but I have to admit I was frightened at the thought of returning to that road if that thing showed up again. Years later, I did go back with friends while on vacation. The road had been paved by then, but that didn't make a difference. That place was eerie even in broad daylight. Story 3. 
On a Sunday night in late September of 1962, I was one of five children playing in Glenwood, Michigan. We had just finished watching our favorite television shows and gathered together searching for a fabled Luna moth. It was around 9 p.m., and we were about to disperse and head home, preparing for school the next day. That's when Jamie Shaw suddenly darted across Dewey Lake Street in pursuit of what he assumed were fireflies. His friend Mark tried to warn him, shouting, Those aren't fireflies, especially not at this time of year. Nevertheless, Jamie was undeterred and continued chasing the distant embers into the swamp. The rest of us continued playing for a while, but soon Katie Keene's mother began calling for her to come home. That's when we realized Jamie hadn't returned. I remember asking, where is Jamie? But nobody had any idea. He hadn't come back from his firefly hunt. Initially, we weren't too alarmed, but as time passed and Jamie failed to reappear, we started to worry. We searched and called for him, but found nothing. We eventually notified Mrs. Howie and Mrs. Shaw about the situation. Soon the entire neighborhood came together and we began searching the area with flashlights. Just as Harry Woods, a local resident, was about to call the police, we made a startling discovery. Jamie was found curled up in a wee area beside the swamp, crying. Katie Keene remembered we were terrified, not knowing what had happened. We thought he might have been attacked or injured. Jamie later recounted a harrowing story to his parents. He claimed that he had been assaulted by a massive, hairy figure that had knocked him to the ground and tossed him across the street. In the days that followed, Jamie didn't attend school for three days. When he finally returned, he shared the story of the attack with his classmates. The school principal later contacted Jamie's father to discuss the injuries on Jamie's back which the principal believed were related to the incident from the previous Sunday night, the same story Jamie had conveyed to them. Jamie's teacher, Miss Sally, initially doubted his account. However, during a recess conversation where Jamie remained convinced that he had been attacked by something that had physically thrown him, Miss Sally stated, I'm astonished he wasn't killed. His injuries were severe. On the evening of Wednesday, October 31st, 1962, I found myself aboard the evening train departing from Detroit, Michigan, making my way back home to Chicago, Illinois. The train had already encountered delays, and as we approached the DAO and KI, it came to an unexpected halt at the remote Dewey Lake Street crossing in Glenwood, Michigan. We remained stationary for around 15 minutes, apparently due to the need to inspect the tracks for debris. During this pause, I gazed out of the window to the northwest into the dark surroundings. It was then that I had a surreal encounter. In the distance, emerging from the dense woods that enveloped the area and approaching the tracks, I saw what appeared to be a faceless tree or a giant stump. The mysterious figure stood there motionless leering at the train for several minutes. Intrigued and somewhat perturbed, I beckoned the attention of two fellow passengers, Emily Clark from Chicago and Roger Wentworth. From St. Louis, to my relief, they also observed the enigmatic sight. After a brief moment, the figure began to move from the tree line toward the train's caboose, which sat shrouded in darkness on the rural tracks. Our consensus was that this figure stood at an astonishing ten feet tall and weighed between 700 to 1,000 pounds. Soon the figure disappeared into the obscurity of the night, moving towards the rear of the train. We decided to call a porter, but before we could do much, the train resumed its journey, accompanied by a loud metallic impact that resonated from the rear of the train. We assumed this was the consequence of the train restarting its journey on these rural treks. The journey continued without any further peculiar incidents, and we eventually reached Chicago. However, upon arriving at Union Station in Chicago, departing passengers noticed a significant dent in the end car of the train. I felt compelled to report what I had witnessed, enlisting the support of my fellow witnesses, Emily Clark and Roger Wentworth. We took our account to the Chicago Police Department, CPD. 
To help the CPD comprehend my encounter better, they assigned a sketch artist to create a detailed rendering based on my description. This sketch is now known as the Garkin train sighting sketch and is widely recognized as the most accurate representation of the creature. Regrettably, despite our efforts, the case was dismissed and referred to other authorities outside of the department. The 1960s were a tumultuous era in Chicago, and the CPD seemed disinclined to invest much time or attention into what they considered a minor matter. They recommended that I file a report with the respective city, county, or state authorities since the incident took place outside of their jurisdiction. They expressed their overwhelming burden with actual crimes and the impracticality of engaging in an investigation related to a supposed monster sighting in Michigan. Consequently, the case was never subjected to further examination. This story is going to be lengthy, and I'm not sure if it will be as intriguing and intense for you as it is for me. But to this day, I still get chills, and my eyes well up when I think about this compilation of events. My tale begins when I was a child. I'm 30, five years old now, so this happened over 10 years ago. I was in seventh grade, around 13 years old, and my friend was having a birthday party. He lived about 20 miles outside of town, and his property bordered a river to the west, with a road about 1,000 yards east of the river. The house was situated about 100 yards from the river, nestled in a wooded area. There were about 10 of us, skateboarding and just doing what kids do, playing in the river and so on. I should mention that it was middle September, and I'm located in the northwest of the United States. As it became dark, the kids were still running around, and the family had a motor home for all the boys to stay in, where they could be loud, watch movies, until late in the morning. Around midnight, all the boys were inside the camper, watching Joe Dirt, my closest friend and I, being young and not wanting to hang out with the boys, were still outside with the birthday boy's sister and her friend, playing on the trampoline. We were clearly making noise, playing and talking. As the night grew later, the girls eventually went inside. My friend and I were just lying on the trampoline, looking out to the east toward the railroad and the highway. There was a 15-foot streetlight, for lack of a better term, between the trampoline and the house. Beyond the streetlight was a strip of cottonwoods and brush that acted as a windrow at the end of the wheat fields we were gazing at. As we were enjoying the night, something about 70 yards away in the windrow caught our attention. It was massive, but moving silently. In fact, everything around us had become eerily silent. The woods, the camper, and us. This thing stepped out, and I was positioned between two trees. It turned its head toward us, making direct eye contact, clearly acknowledging our presence. What we saw were two piercing red eyes atop a deer like head with antlers protruding. It was incredibly tall, at least seven feet, when I checked the branch next to it the next day. I've spent years hunting and been in some very sticky situations. I've even had a mountain lion tracking me in the woods, but the only thing I can compare this experience to is the feeling of being prey. In my heart of hearts, I knew there was nothing I could do to protect myself from this entity. The most perplexing part of the entire encounter was that I'm a very logical person, and even today it's challenging for me to understand. I need to stress the situational awareness of what was happening. The streetlight between us and this entity was still illuminated, and yet this creature was casting a shadow towards the light pole with nothing illuminating it from behind. That was the thought that haunted me for the rest of that night and continues to do so. This entity slipped behind another tree and vanished down the windrow. For at least five minutes after, not a single word was spoken. Finally, I broke the silence and shifted my gaze from the tree lion to my buddy, who was still lying next to me, and I managed to fumble out. Did you see that? He stammered back with a yes. The rest of that night is quite blurry to me, but we sprinted at full speed to the camper where our friends were. 
We must have looked pale as ghosts, because within minutes, the kids were bombarding us with questions about what was wrong. I don't remember what we said, still reeling from what had just happened, but I recall being very adamant about no one, and I mean no one, going out there, to the point where other kids were beginning to get scared. The next morning I measured where we had seen this being, and it was at least seven foot five tall, even while crouched at the neck. Even then, I was too scared to go to that spot alone. But this isn't where the story ends. It goes on much further. A few years passed, and the friend I had this experience with is now my best friend. We were partying, having a few drinks one night, and this experience came up. We began opening up to each other as close friends do, and I explained to him that I had been plagued by nightmares of this encounter in the past few weeks. His response was far from comforting. He, too, had been experiencing very similar nightmares. In a drunken stupor, we made a pact to call each other the next time we were awakened by these nightmares. Fast forward two weeks, and I wake up panicked, feeling pursued by this entity. I immediately remember our plan, knowing that my friend is the only person I can talk to about this, so I call him, but he goes straight to voicemail. I hang up, and my phone rings instantly with my friend calling me. He's just had the exact same dream at the exact same time. Here's where the story gets eerie and the reason I haven't shared it until now. I've always had odd things happening to me. Supernatural experiences, which I can share another time if you're interested. But at that time, I was 27 and dating a girl in the same town where all of this happened. It was fall, just like when all these other incidents occurred. We were sharing scary stories, and I told her the story I've just shared with you. It was then that I found out what I had seen could be either a wendigo or a skinwalker. My girlfriend and I began delving into these stories about skinwalkers, and she was always amazed that when these stories played or had similarities to mine, she could see a physical reaction from me, such as shivers or very noticeable goosebumps. She always said that this was the most believable evidence, because it's almost impossible to fake. So, while learning about skinwalkers together, we found lore that says once one has seen you, it doesn't stop looking for you. This idea sent shivers down my spine. Additionally, when you speak of them, they become alerted to your presence, and we had been talking a lot about this. I had to leave for work one night, and I was gone the entire night. Our room was in a basement that faced the backyard, which had a broken fence leading out into a large park. While I was gone, my girlfriend had our window open late at night. She was lying in bed when she heard one of her cats meowing loudly toward the broken fence. It wasn't too weird, but the meowing continued, and instead of coming to the window, it persisted. She grew frustrated and turned on a nightlight to say something to the cat. As she approached the window, she realized that the cat she heard meowing was sleeping at the foot of the bed. She slammed the window shut, and thankfully she didn't call for the cat to come inside. She's convinced that it was the same entity attempting to gain access to our house by shape-shifting. This story still haunts me to this day. I fear that by putting it into words, I may open myself to this being and become noticed once more. Please let me know your thoughts on what this creature might be and what I should do, as it seems to come back every couple of years to find me, and it has been a couple of years now. October 2000. It was later in the evening when I was driving back to my in-law's house by myself and was going down a dirt road. I saw something in the ditch up ahead and on the right and didn't really know what it was until I got up far enough so that my headlights could catch it. I didn't know anything about dogmen until a couple of years ago. This thing had an outline of a huge dog, but when I got closer it turned and looked at me. I just floored it. It didn't really bother me until I noticed it looking at me, and I saw that it was actually grasping what it was eating. I got back and didn't say exactly what I saw. I just asked them if they were any big dogs or wolves of where they lived. My father-in-law just laughed and said no. 
Then he asked why I didn't tell him anything. Though the thing I will never forget are those reddish-orange eyes that just kept staring at me deep into my soul. I'm an avid mountain bike rider. Back in July 1995, Sue, my girlfriend at the time, and I took a mountain bike camping vacation from California to Moab, Utah. We had set up camp in the middle of the Moab Desert. We were alone as far as you could see, and you could see across the desert with no obstructions. One night, about an hour into our sleep, we were woken up by something that my brain would not let me accept at the time. We could hear something walking up to our tent and around the general area. We whispered to each other, What the hell is that? The steps were from a two-legged animal. The amount of noise it was making was equivalent to what a large truck would make driving on a crushed rock road. Each time it stepped, you could hear it walking towards the tent, and with just a few steps, it was inches away. At first, we thought maybe it was a person, but no, it's much too big. Maybe a bear. No, it would not be walking with only two legs and with what sounded like long steps. It had to have been at least 600. 800 pounds, by the noise it was making with each step. We were almost frozen with fear as each move we made impaired our hearing. All we could do was monitor this large creature. The fear and hopelessness we felt were off the charts as we heard it slowly step towards our tent, get to within a foot, and then stay there for 10 to 20 minutes, then walk around the campsite for another 10 minutes, and then it left. We couldn't sleep for hours. It's been 25 years, but I remember it like it was yesterday. We pulled up stakes and left the desert the next day. Before we would sleep at night, my girlfriend would question whether I had my Beretta Nanim under my pillow at night. When we camped after that, every night she religiously asked if I had my gun. I remember the next morning we did talk about it. Sue who was Native American, said a few things about it might be a Sasquatch since her people believed in them. At the time, I was just confused. But in hindsight, what we experienced didn't compute. After discussing it, we pretty much concluded we didn't know what the hell it was. But it was freaking big, and we're lucky we are still alive. I was born, raised, and live in Port Alberni, Vancouver Island, British Columbia. As a child growing up here, my grandmother and mother would occasionally tell us stories of individual experiences they had with Sasquatch on their farm back in the 1940s. When it was told to us, I always thought they existed among us. I drive a taxi here in Port Alberni, and one night in early May 2006, around midnight, I was driving back from Sprout Lake with a passenger who was intoxicated but awake in the front passenger seat. We were on the Pacific Rim Highway coming down the hill towards Hector Road when my headlights caught this creature crossing the double line in the road. It was walking kind of hunched over with a hobble to its walk. It had black short fur all over its body with the exception of its face. When the lights of my cab hit his face, I noticed it had very wrinkled light-colored skin on its face. He didn't look at me, so I only saw the side of his face. I noticed it was very skinny, with very large slender hands and feet, with skinny arms and legs. I figured it was seven or eight feet tall. It stood upright, but it was hunched over, so it's hard to tell. It was trying to get to the other side of the road, where there were trees, brush, and a swamp. There were no other vehicles on the road behind me or coming in the other direction. My passenger said to me as we passed the thing, What was that? I said, I think that was a Sasquatch. He said, Are you kidding me? I said, No, that was a Sasquatch. He didn't say anything else on the rest of the ride. I know what I saw, and it wasn't human. The way it walked and how thin it was with its large, thin hands and feet convinced me it wasn't human or anything I'd seen before. I didn't stop when I saw this thing. At the time, the Pacific Rim Highway, or Highway 4, is a major highway that runs through Port Alberni. 
There was a bend in the road, so I didn't want to stop and look where this thing went, as I didn't want to cause a possible accident. Also, it was raining lightly, and it was dark, so I would find it hard to believe someone would be playing a prank on a dark, rainy Saturday night, crossing a major highway in a gorilla suit. Most people at the time were in the local pubs or nightclubs at that time on a Saturday night or at home. I have told a few people about my experiences here in Port Alberni, and one of the Hypocrisy First Nations people I spoke to about this said it sounds like you saw the old man. She told me a few people over the years, as well as herself on that reserve where I saw it, call it the old man. Well, that's my story. I didn't have any negative feelings about seeing this thing, just surprised. This occurred near New York City in Westchester County very early on the morning of December 30, 2020. My dad was driving, and my mom and I were asleep because it was so late. My dad pulled over and woke us up. He was royally flipping out. We didn't know what was wrong. He pointed to the overpass, and all you could see were these intense, glowing, bright red eyes. At this point, we didn't know what it was, so we just started driving again. When we reached the overpass, the thing was still on the overpass, so my dad decided to stop. Then the thing swooped down and landed on the hood of our car. This creature landed with such a force it dented the hood. It then proceeded to stand up on the hood, and it was six. Seven feet tall, black, and had wide, bat-like wings. We were all terrified at this point. My dad takes out the phone and calls the New York Highway Patrol. They laugh at him and hang up saying they didn't like prank calls. The creature was just sitting there. I took out my camera and photographed it with the flash on. The thing then jumped off the car and took off like it was afraid of the camera flash. When we got to my aunt's, we told her, and she said there were countless reports of this thing. Then I showed her the picture on my camera, and she got really freaked out. I have been doing research over the past couple of weeks and trying to find something that resembles it. At this point, I believe it was a mothman. The crazy thing is that the photo disappeared from my phone a few days later. I had downloaded it on my computer, but that vanished as well. Have you heard of other photos of the Mothman vanishing? I was totally freaked out. As I embarked on my solo hike through the pristine winter wilderness, the quiet, untouched snowscape around me was a sight to behold. The crisp, cold air bit at my cheeks, and the untouched snow crunched beneath my size 11-5 hiking boots. I relished the solitude, the beauty of the world blanketed in a pristine layer of white, and the crunch of my footsteps in the snow. Little did I know that this serene experience would soon take a puzzling and eerie turn. I was a seasoned hiker, no stranger to the majesty of the great outdoors, and I often trekked these trails in the colder months. Today the snow was particularly thick, untouched except for the occasional rabbit track. The sun was descending, casting a soft golden light on the surrounding firs, their branches laden with the weight of winter snowfall. As I made my way through the trail, my eyes were drawn to an unusual sight, a set of footprints in the snow, approximately 15 inches long. What perplexed me even more was that they were clearly barefoot. I examined the prints with a growing sense of unease. Their size was enormous, far longer than my own size eleven five boots. I couldn't fathom who would be out here without shoes in these freezing temperatures, and it sent a shiver down my spine. The unsettling discovery of these footprints piqued my curiosity, and I decided to follow them, thinking it might lead to a fellow hiker who needed assistance. As I followed the prints deeper into the forest, I noticed that the once stately fir trees standing at a towering 15 to 20 feet, had all been broken, their tops bent and pointed off the trail. It was a sight that defied the laws of nature and logic. The trail was covered in a thick layer of snow, but I couldn't help but observe that my own footprints only sank in about three to four inches. 
Yet these barefoot prints were far deeper, at least twice as deep into the snow. It was as if the person who made them carried an unimaginable weight. My heart raced as I considered the implications of this eerie discovery. With each step, my unease grew, the cold air that was once refreshing now chilling me to the bone. What could have made these prints, and who was the mysterious barefoot traveler in this desolate winter landscape? A growing sense of foreboding urged me to retrace my steps and make my way back to safety. As I made my way back along the trail, my gaze remained fixed on those haunting footprints in the snow. The mystery of their origin would linger long after I left the winter woods, a strange and unsettling tale that I would recount to fellow adventurers in search of answers. Walking my dog one morning, I noticed strange footprints on the side of the dirt. I looked back jokingly as if I felt something watching me. Nothing, so I keep walking. About five minutes later, I turned to my side because I felt something watching me again. Again, nothing, another three minutes go by, and I glance to my left, and there's something climbing down a tree. I shrug it off, but then I hear a deafening scream as that of a wendigo or skinwalker. I start sprinting back to my house whilst it was chasing me. I made it back just in time while my dog was barking up a flame. I rush him inside, and I notice a wendigo standing outside, holding a body much like a bird. I remember wendigos are scared of fire, so I started to make one in my fireplace. I kept it going all day. My dad is a seafaring tugboat captain. My favorite story he's told me, and there are so many, is when he was in the Arctic, close to the North Pole. Due to the curve of the earth and reflection off the atmosphere, he could see, clear as day, a coastal town in Russia that was hundreds of miles away. More strange than creepy, but here you go. We were fishing on the St. Lawrence River once. We had rented a houseboat and were cruising up and down the river, pulling in pike and having a nice time of it. It was in the middle of the day, hot, humid, and still. My father and I were both on the bow, just trolling and chatting. Suddenly, my toes felt funny. They felt swollen and itchy, and then an intense, burning itch suddenly came over them. Only my ties, mind you. Suddenly, I started bleeding from the cuticles of both my big toes. Not a heavy flow, more like an oozing of blood that lasted all of about five seconds. It stopped as suddenly as it started, and I felt completely fine afterward. But here's the weird part. I turned to tell my father, and he too had blood oozing from the cuticles of his big toes, too. We compared notes and had both experienced the same weird sensation at the same time, and it went away as suddenly as it came for both of us. Same place, same time, same duration. It never happened before and never since. I once asked my doctor about it, and he just shrugged it off, so may... Ex-Canadian Navy, ex-commercial fisherman, now a sea kayaking guide. I have to tell the story here. We were fishing on a salmon trawler off the west coast of Vancouver Island. Off of Nightnut Bar, the area is known for thick fog. The radar broke down and the skipper, fearing a collision with another fishing boat, sent me up the mast to keep a lookout. Once up, I could see above the fog easily, yet could not even see my feet. All was going well. I could see the tall tree on shore and other boats, masts, and with me calling down turns by degrees of helm, we were able to continue fishing. The fog, however, did not burn off, but got thicker and thicker until the guys on deck could not see to work at all. The skipper decided to run back to port and try fix the radar. Since no one was going to be able to fish this opening, we were pretty sure to get another next day. So we turned up to seaward with the plan of just heading south outside the other boats, then turning back in until I could see the tree again and watch for the lighthouse at Port Renfrew. 
We made the turnout, and then we just kept going. I kept yelling down, but no one answered. I could not see what was going on below me, or see well enough to attempt to climb down into the fog. And when I tried, I began to choke on it. After only about 20-30 minutes of heading seaward, we cleared the sea fog near the coast, enough that I was able to see well enough to climb down. The whole crew was collapsed on deck at the bottom of the mast. It appeared they had all tried to climb up, but had been fighting each other. The coroner later ruled the cause of death is drowning. The fog took all of my shipmates. I am the sole survivor of the Ocean Fury tragedy. Edit. This is a story I tell often now as a sea kayaking guide when people ask me why I quit fishing. I come from a small coastal town and it was very common for people to enlist on ships. Both my grandfathers and my father did it, and a whole lot of other men did and do as well. One of my grandmother's friends was a local fisherman. He used to fish the fjords and whatnot with his boat. He used a trawling net connected to a winch to do it. Caught quite a lot. Well, one day he was out doing his usual route. The boat suddenly stopped going forwards, despite the engine still running. He thought that was odd, given how well he knows the area, but he figured he might have caught his net on some rocks or something that he somehow didn't know was there after fishing there for a long time. He tried increasing the power, hoping to dislodge whatever held him in place. But that didn't work. He noticed that not only was he not going forwards, he was in point of fact going backwards and picking up speed. So something was dragging his boat backwards faster than he could move forwards. He thought, what the hell? Is there a submarine under me or what is this? He's a very level-headed guy, you see. Doesn't panic easily. He tried to pull in his nets, but the nets didn't go up. His boat started to go down. At that point, he really started to freak out and cut the nets and set course for home. Before he got far, a gigantic basking shark surfaced right next to the boat. He knew they're not dangerous to humans normally, but well, by the time he got back to town, he was visibly shaking with fear. This is secondhand, so take it with a grain of salt. I've only done minor boating, but some of my gaming buddies are coasties. CK served as an intel officer on the USCGC, but well back when she was on the Bering Sea Patrol. He was on duty on comms on the night that the Arctic Rose went down back in 2001. Fifteen men went down with the Arctic Rose, and they only ever found one body, the captain, and he wasn't even fully in his survival suit. It was the worst loss that has been suffered in those waters in this century. So about two years later, they're back on the EMBL station, and this time, they're helping locate the wreck using an ROV, trying to gather some sense of what caused her to sink so fast. They're moving the ROV about, trying to get it below decks. My friend is watching the feed as the ROV is being piloted. In his words, I saw a skeletal arm suddenly move across the video screen. I don't mean just floating remains. It was moving in an animated fashion. Then we lost the feed officially. The ROV had got caught below deck in an obstacle that we were unable to extract it from. But unofficially, every year on the straight, Sedna takes her toll. Sometimes mild, sometimes heavy, but Sedna has her price for letting men fish those seas. Sedna keeps those whom she takes. Avid deep sea fisherman here. I fish the east side of Florida quite a bit. We will go 25, 100 miles out to fish reefs or structure on the bottom. We also trolled quite a bit. One time we were trolling for kingfish and hooked up onto something massive on a downrigger. When I mean massive, I mean huge. Whatever we had on was peeling drag like nothing. We figured we hooked into a porpoise until a mako about eight, ten feet long jumped around thirty yards from the boat. That shark jumped three more times until it frayed our leader enough to snap it. 
We never thought we would catch a mako that big, especially on the troll. We also find rafts all the time. We found rafts made out of tires, PVC, foam, wood, and even four kayaks zip-tied together with wooden planks. Tied to the top of them, most of the rafts we find look like they have just been used also, which is pretty eerie. Another time on the west coast of Florida, I was spearfishing off a rig and the water was crystal clear. There was zero wind, so I could see pretty far in the water around the rig. Let me tell you, it's quite scary when you can just make out the shadow of a shark, right? Then it disappears in waters below. Most of the sharks we see around the rigs, too, are huge hammerheads. These hammerheads can get massive. I speared a mangrove snapper and one of these hammerheads came and ripped it right off my spear. This was moments right after I shot it, too. This happened yesterday when me and Dad were alone at home. His room is in the third floor and mine in the second. He leaves every day after his afternoon lunch and leaves his room door opened with a key on the inside of the door. When he comes back in the evening, we found out the door is closed and locked from the inside. We thought Mom came and closed it, but she said she didn't and she was at my aunt's all day. We started to freak out because this is beyond normal. The room has a toilet and windows to the roof, so I climbed and got to the room through the windows to find the door is really locked, and the key is inside. There is no one that could sneak in from the windows because there was no one at home, and we have a third floor house, so no one can go inside if it is not from the main door. Does anyone have any explications to this? My dad worked in the timber industry his whole life. His father was a logger, and he grew up in and around the woods. My dad started his own logging company when he was 18 and has owned and operated shake and shingle mills from Oregon clear up to Thorn Bay, Aska. He is an intelligent man and holds over a dozen patents for various pieces of equipment he has designed and built over the years. He has employed dozens of people over the years, all of them spending extensive time in the wilderness. When I was a boy, I remember hearing bits and pieces of conversations among some of the men at the mill. Although nobody would tell me directly, I understood that something had gone on before I was born, and it involved one of the foremen, Joan. They weren't joking around, they were genuinely afraid and wouldn't talk about it with a kid. When I was young, my dad wouldn't tell me about it because I would often go out into the woods cutting blocks with him on the weekends, and he didn't want me to be afraid of the woods. While I was speaking with him last weekend, I told him of a couple of strange events that happened to me later in the wilderness, and that reminded me of the hints at a story I heard when I was a boy. After some prodding, he told me the following story. In the mid-1960s, my dad owned a large roofing product mill in Aberdeen. Way. He had teams of men that would cut the fallen old-growth cedar salvage left after a logging operation. He had permits to salvage a large amount of wood in the coastal areas of Grays Harbor County, primarily in the area around Copales Beach. Several of the men on his cutting crews lived in and around Copales Beach. His foreman... A man I will call Joan for the story was a bright, down-to-earth hard worker. My dad trusted him with thousands of dollars of vehicles and equipment, as well as the safety of his crews. He was not the kind of man to make up stories. On a Monday morning sometime in July, John was several hours late for work. This was highly unusual as he was always there early, getting the saws and trucks ready for the day. My dad said he was visibly shaken up, and when he asked him what was wrong, he asked my dad to go in the office so the others wouldn't hear them. They went in and sat down, and Joan simply said something destroyed our house this weekend. My dad thought he said someone broke into the house and asked John if it was someone he knew. Joan said, you don't understand. This wasn't a person. It was a, I don't know what it was, but it completely trashed the house. The family is going to stay with my brother and Elma for a while. My dad asked him to explain what had happened. 
John said that when he got home from work Friday evening, his youngest son, Tim, who was around four at the time, told him he saw a big cowman walking at the edge of their field that afternoon. He thought the boy meant cowboy because some of his neighbors wore cowboy hats when they were out in the sun. He asked him if the man was wearing a cowboy hat, and the boy said, no, daddy, he was a cowman, furry and stinky like the cows. He asked his wife if she knew what he was talking about, and she said Tim was playing on the porch that afternoon when he came running in and said the cowman was stuck on the fence. He was very excited, so she went out to see what he was talking about. She said as she opened the door, she was hit by a horrible smell like wet dogs and garbage. Tim was pointing across to the field opposite their house and said, He got loose. She looked where he was gesturing and could see the top strand of barbed wire bouncing up and down, as if somebody had just pulled on it really hard and let it go. She didn't see the cowman and noticed nothing out of the ordinary except for the smell. She told Tim to come inside to play for the rest of the day. She felt uneasy and a little scared. Their older son... Joan Jr., who was 12 at the time, was at a friend's house and walked home a short while after Tim saw his cowman. He told her somebody had followed him home, walking in the woods off the right side of the road. He never seen who it was. They never left the woods, but he said it had to be a really big man. He would hear large sticks cracking, and the footsteps were very heavy. Once he got to the driveway of their house where the wood stopped at the field where his brother had his sighting, the footsteps stopped and Joan Jr. never saw anything. He was pretty shaken up by the event and wanted his dad to go out to the woods and check it out with him. Later that evening, John strapped on his 357 and took his older son out into the field to have a look. They first walked to the area where the cowman was supposedly stuck on the fence and walked down the fence line looking for anything. They came upon a large clump of long reddish-brown hair tangled in the top strand of barbed wire. He tried to pull it off, but it was really tangled up, so he pulled out his buck knife and sawed it off. He said the hair was over a foot long, real coarse and stringy. There appeared to be a bit of flesh matted in the clump, and the top wire was pulled loose from one of the posts. Whatever was hung up on the fence was very big. He handed the hair to his son to hold, and they climbed through the fence and walked toward the woods. He said he was looking for any sign of tracks on the ground. The hair kind of looked like it was from a horse's mane or tail. The ground was a solid, grassy field, and there were no hoof prints or any other tracks he could see. The edge of the woods began about ten feet from the fence line, and they entered on a small game trail that deer frequented. It was around eight at night, and in the woods it was getting to be fairly dark. They walked for a ways and soon began to smell the rotting garbage or wet dog odor his wife reported earlier. John said he got the feeling they were being watched. The hair on the back of his neck was standing up. He told his son they should head back before it got dark, and the boy didn't argue. As they began walking back out, they could hear heavy footsteps off to their left. They stopped, and the footsteps stopped. They walked on, nearly to the clearing, and Joan whispered to his son to run like hell to the house on the count of three. John Jr. nodded, and John whispered, One, two, three, and gave his son a push in the back to get him started, then spun around and raced off the trail in the opposite direction, toward the footsteps with his gun drawn. Off the trail, the underbrush was dense with ferns and bushes. He had a hard time making headway, but as he got closer, he could hear it moving away from him, deeper into the woods. At this time, he told my dad that he thought it was a vagrant camping out in the woods and possibly scoping houses out to rob at night. John was a big man and capable of taking care of himself in most any situation, and he had a large caliber handgun, so he wasn't too worried about confronting a vagrant in the woods. He was a few yards off the trail in deep brush when he heard the movement stop just ahead of him. He stopped to look and listen, and thought he saw movement by a large tree like someone was trying to hide there. He leveled his gun and said, Come out nice and slow or I swear to God I'll come back there and shoot you. It was silent for a moment, and then he caught movement out the corner of his eye and spun around to his right for a better look. He said it looked like a huge bear moving through the brush. 
He could only see bits of it through the dense ferns, but it was moving quietly away from the tree on four legs. It was about fifteen feet away from him. At first he thought it was a bear, and then suddenly he saw a huge hairy arm with a human-like hand reach out of the brush and grab a small alder tree. The tree was about four inches in diameter, and it grabbed hold about five feet up. He said it happened so fast it was a blur, but the thing pulled itself upright out of the brush by holding the tree. It stood on two legs and turned its upper body to glare at John. It was enormous. He couldn't believe how bulky it was. He said it was well over seven feet tall and at least half that big through the chest. It was too dark to make out many features, but its eyes seemed to glow a deep red, and he thought he could see teeth like it was curling its lips back. It stood for just a brief moment and then lunged ahead, pushing back on the tree with tremendous force. The tree snapped loudly and crashed into the trees around it, getting hung up in the branches and not falling to the ground. It then disappeared into the deep brush with frightening speed, sounding like a bulldozer with no engine sounds. Joan stood there in shock, his gun temporarily forgotten, and then he realized it was heading toward the house, the way his son had went. He turned and ran to the trail, hoping to gain ground on it and cut it off before it reached the clearing. He hit the trail and ran as fast as he could toward the clearing, all the while hearing the creature thrash through the brush on his side. He burst into the clearing and looked frantically about for his son. John Jr. was standing just inside of the fenced field, waiting for his dad. John screamed at him to run to the house. Then he saw the thing crash out of the woods about fifty feet to his left. It crossed the ten-foot clearing and stepped over the fence in two strides and was running through the field parallel to his son in a matter of seconds. John screamed at his son to run faster and took aim at the creature. He didn't fire because he was afraid to hit his son or his house, so he vaulted over the fence and ran in pursuit of them. He could see it angling toward his son and knew there was no way his boy would make it to the gate before it cut him off. In desperation, he pointed the gun to the ground at his side and fired as he ran, hoping to scare it. It veered more sharply toward his son and put on an enormous burst of speed. He heard his boy scream as they seemed to collide. He saw the creature dip its shoulder down a little bit, and suddenly Joan Jr. was airborne. He flew about ten feet, then hit the ground rolling. The creature never paused. It continued to run at an amazing speed in a loop back towards the woods. Once the line of fire was clear, John stopped and squeezed off the remaining five rounds at the retreating creature. He was pretty sure all the shots went wild. The creature never made a sound or slowed down and was soon over the fence and back in the woods. He reached his son, who was shaken up but not physically hurt. He asked his dad if it was a bear. Apparently, little John was so busy running for the house that he didn't see the creature running after him. He said something big and black suddenly ran into him, and he felt a huge paw hit his bottom. And he said he felt like he was falling. Joan pulled his son to his feet, and they ran through the gate and into the house, locking the door behind him. They were both out of breath and white as ghosts. His wife was screaming at him, demanding to know what the gunshots were for and if they were all right. When he could catch his breath, he told her to make sure the back door was locked. He was going to call the sheriff. He went to the phone and began to dial the number. This was before 911. Then stopped and wondered what exactly he was going to say. He hung up the phone, realizing what an idiot he would look like if he told the sheriff the boogeyman just chased them out of the woods. He told his wife that it was a large animal, possibly a bear. He didn't know how to begin to tell her their four-year-old was right. His cowman was real, and it was more frightening than anything he could imagine. He told them all to keep the doors locked and stay away from the windows. Around ten o'clock that night, both boys were in bed, and Joan and his wife sat down to watch the news. They soon heard a loud, moaning cry, kind of like the siren on the volunteer fire department. It would stretch out for a long time and then end with a whoop-whoop sound. It was coming from the woods opposite the house. His wife asked, what the hell is that? Joan answered truthfully. That is Tim's cowman. He then described to her the full details of what had happened, and she immediately wanted to call the sheriff.
He persuaded her that they would sound crazy and that he would handle it himself. She reluctantly agreed and told him she didn't want either of the kids to go outside until this thing was gone. The howling went on until around midnight when it got quiet again. John wanted to stay up through the night and watch over the house, but he had a long day at work and the excitement earlier had worn him out. They went to bed around one in the morning and had no further problems that night. They slept in that morning and the boys were already up and watching cartoons when they got out of bed. The first thing little John said was that he had heard the bear rubbing against the house last night. He said he was too scared to get up and tell his parents and fell back asleep soon after. Then Tim said the cowman talks funny. This stopped John cold. He asked his son, When did you talk to the cowman? Tim replied last night in my room. John asked, The cowman was in your room. No, Daddy, he's too big for my room. He talked to my window, Tim said, and turned back to the cartoons. What did the cowman say? Tim, John asked. He talks funny. I don't know what he said. He talks like this. Oh, ah, oh, oh, Tim said and started making strange monkey-like noises. Did the cowman try to get in your window? John asked, breaking out in a cold sweat. He's too big for that. He made funny faces. He has Lincoln log teeth, Tim said with a smile. John later learned Tim meant it had square teeth that looked the same size as the small blocks in a Lincoln log set. It apparently spent quite a while talking and making faces outside the boy's window. Tim said it lay down and went to sleep outside, and he could hear it snoring. John walked to his younger son's room and cautiously peered out the window. No sleeping cowman, John told the boys to get dressed. They were going to go visit their uncle in Elma for the day. After his wife and kids left, he called one of the men from his crew and asked him to come over. I'll call him Patrick. He was an ex-state patrolman, and my dad said he was kicked off the force because of his drinking problem. He was a good worker and never got drunk before dark, so John figured they would have most of the day to look for this thing. When Patrick arrived, John greeted him at the door and said, Are you up for some hunting? Seeing how it was not hunting season, Patrick told him he doesn't poach and doesn't even want to know about it if John did. John told him it wasn't deer he was after and went on to explain the previous night's events. Patrick didn't really believe him but could see he was sincere and still shook up. John had his pistol and uh, bolt action 30.6. Patrick had a 38 in his car and John loaned him a 12 gauge. They first circled the house looking for any signs of a nocturnal visitor. At the back of the house there was a spigot for the garden hose and it always leaked. There was a patch of ground worn bare of grass under it, and it had turned to mud. In the center of the mud, there was a huge clear imprint of what looked like a bare human foot. John said it was at least 18 inches long and very wide. It was so clear that he got the feeling it was left there on purpose. They found no other prints around the house and in places in the field and woods where a track could be made, the creature seemed to avoid them off to the side of the track in the mud were four straight lines about eight inches long. He said it looked like someone had raked their fingers through the mud. When they circled around the side of the house and got to Tim's window, they saw what it was for. Above the top of the window, a good seven feet up, were four muddy streaks, and on the window itself were dozens of large muddy fingerprints. The glass wasn't cracked or broken, just smeared with mud. By this time, Patrick was fast becoming convinced something strange had indeed happened the night before. Before going out into the woods, John wanted to feed the family's pigs. They had two of them, apparently fairly young, weighing around 40 pounds each. The pig pen was about a hundred yards away from the house, behind an old barn. As they got closer, John became concerned because they couldn't hear them making any noise. Usually, they squealed like crazy when they knew food was near at hand, but this morning it was completely silent. They rounded the corner and the pen was empty. No sign of damage or struggle. The pigs were just gone. They searched the barn but found nothing out of place, so they decided to hit the woods and try to kill this thing. They entered on the same trail John and John had used the day before, 
John showed Patrick the broken fence wire and told him again about the hair. It was a bright summer morning, and John was surprised at the difference from the previous evening. The night before had been still and silent. Now the woods were alive with birds and small animals. He showed Patrick the broken tree, and they followed the creature's trail and found several more trees and large branches twisted and broken. They could see large, faint impressions of footprints where the ground was soft. They followed the deer trail further into the woods and encountered nothing unusual. By noon, they were both getting hungry, so they hiked back to the house for lunch. They spent the rest of the day poking around, but saw nothing more out of the ordinary. Just before dark that night, his wife and kids drove up. He and Patrick were sitting on the porch with the guns, watching the woods. His wife asked if they had seen anything. John told her about the footprint and mud on the window. Patrick had retrieved a pint of booze from his car and was well on his way to getting smashed. John decided he didn't want a frightened drunk with a gun around his family, so he suggested that Patrick could go home. Nothing was going to happen anyway. Patrick agreed and drove off, and Joan continued to watch the woods. His wife brought out a plate of food and a Coleman lantern and a flashlight. He told her he would stay out here and watch the house through the night. Before they went to bed, he went into their bedroom and, with help from his wife, pushed the king-sized bed as far from the windows as they could. They agreed that his wife and kids would all sleep in that bed for the night, and he would keep watch around the house. She had grown up hunting and knew how to handle a gun as good as him, so she insisted on keeping the shotgun in the room with them. He agreed after making her promise to ask for a name before shooting anything. If it replied, John, please don't shoot it. There was a full moon that night, and John could see across the field and into the inky dark of the woods. The night air was filled with the sound of thousands of crickets, and the pond behind the house was full of croaking frogs. As the moon rose higher, clumps of weeds in the field began casting sinister shadows, and before long John was seeing big hairy creatures sneaking up on him, and each of them, he stood up and lit a cigarette, trying to shake the fear and concentrate on the task at hand. As he smoked, he wandered to the end of the porch and stood looking at the darkened barn. Something was different, but he couldn't quite place it. The front of the barn facing the house was open, and the moonlight was hitting it from the side, casting the interior in deep shadows. He stood watching the black opening as he finished his smoke, thinking about the missing pig. He then realized what was wrong. All the crickets and frogs had gone silent. It was as quiet as the inside of a mausoleum at night. He could hear the minute shrill buzz of his own nervous system. As he turned to walk back to his chair, he thought he saw movement in the barn. He looked intently at the opening and could make out nothing, then turned his head a bit to the side and saw what looked like two red eyes hovering about eight feet off the ground. He couldn't see them if he looked straight at them, but when he averted his eyes a little, they became clearer. They were a deep, burning coal red, almost invisible in the dark. Every few seconds they would disappear when the creature blinked. His heart began thudding in his chest, and he waited for it to leave the barn and approach the house. He slowly backed up to his chair, never looking away, and picked up his thirty point six. He walked back to the end of the porch and watched and waited. He stood looking at the blinking red eyes for what seemed like hours, and then the eyes blinked out and never came back. He watched intently but could see no movement. He thought for a moment, then grabbed the flashlight and shined it at the barn. The flashlight was too small to penetrate the darkness of the barn from this distance. He had to get closer. He was none too keen about leaving the relative safety of the porch and confronting a glowing-eyed monster in his barn but he was damned if he was going to live in fear in his own house. He left the porch and began slowly working his way toward the barn, taking his time, building his courage up. He got closer and could still see no movement. It had gone further into the dark. He got within twenty feet of the opening, and his flashlight would now penetrate the gloom in the barn. He moved the feeble beam of light over the contents of the barn, an old tractor, and old pickup boxes and buckets, too many places for something to hide, even something big. He cautiously walked closer, now shining the flashlight down the barrel of his rifle. 
He stopped at the entrance and shined the light all over, searching the corners and under the vehicles. He stepped into the barn, every sense straining for sound or movement. He walked around the pickup, tensing for a huge, hairy arm to reach out and grab him at any second. He made his way clear to the rear of the barn without seeing anything, and slowly turned around to leave. He felt both relieved not to have encountered it in the dark barn and frightened and somewhat confused about where it could have gone. As he was walking out, he glanced at the wide stairs leading up into the hayloft and froze. He knew with complete certainty that it had climbed those stairs and was waiting for him to walk out under the hayloft and jump down upon him. He couldn't move. He was literally frozen in fear. He swore he could hear the floorboard softly creak above him as an enormous weight edged stealthily closer to the edge. He stood with his heart pounding in his ears, unable to move or act. Suddenly there was a booming explosion of a shotgun from the house, followed by his wife screaming. His paralysis broke and he bolted out of the barn toward the house, completely forgetting what may have been in the hayloft. As he ran toward the house, he heard an inhuman roar coming from the woods behind the house. It sounded pissed off and in pain. It screamed again, and he heard branches breaking as it plowed through the forest, thankfully away from the house. He got to the house and almost knocked down the front door in his hurry to get inside. He ran down the hall to their room and found his family huddled together on the bed, sobbing. One of the windows was blown out, and his wife was still pointing the shotgun at it. When he burst into the room, she swung the gun in his direction and screamed, and he hit the floor. He waited for the blast, but it didn't come. He slowly stood up, and she had put the gun down, and he went to the bed. He asked her what had happened, but she was too shook up to answer just then. Tim started crying. Why did you shoot the cowman, Mommy? Why? John Jr. had his face buried against her shoulder, crying. After they calmed down a bit, he told them to get up and follow him. He led them to the living room, then went out the open front door and looked carefully around. He could see no sign of it. All was quiet again. He told them to come out and get in the car. They ran out in their pajamas and piled in the car. He got in and drove them to his brother's house in Elma. On the way there, they had calmed down enough to tell him what happened. She said a couple hours after they went to bed, she finally dozed off. She was awakened by Tim talking to someone and this bizarre clicking, chirping sound. Tim wasn't in the bed. He was standing in front of one of the windows. The moonlight was shining through both windows, illuminating the room pretty good. But there was a large shadow, like a tree obscuring the window in front of Tim. She knew there were no trees close enough to cast a shadow. She told to get away from the window. Mommy, listen. The cowman can sound like a bird. Tim said, pointing excitedly at the dark figure in the window. Timmy, get away from the window, she said, trying to keep her voice quiet. Right after she spoke, the noises from outside changed. It went from a soft chirping to a strange gibbering, almost like human speech with an occasional pig-like snort thrown in. At this time, little John woke up and said, What is that? rather loudly. This seemed to incite the creature, and it hit the side of the house with its fists hard enough for the walls to tremble. At this, little John screamed, and Tim yelled, Quiet! You're going to scare him away! She yelled at Tim to get away from the window again and reached up on the headboard and grabbed the shotgun. She got out of the bed and started toward Tim. The creature leaned down and looked straight in the window at her. She screamed and raised the shotgun, afraid to shoot because her son was so close to it. She started for word to grab Tim, and there was an explosion of breaking glass. A gigantic hairy arm reached through the window toward her son. She screamed again and fired over Tim's head, blowing out the rest of the window and hitting the creature with a zero buckshot. It jerked backwards out of the window and disappeared into the dark. A few seconds later, she heard it screaming in the woods. It was trying to get Tim. It was trying to grab my baby. She started crying again, and he comforted her as best he could while driving. They stayed the rest of that night and the following night with his brother's family. He told his brother about it, but could see he didn't really believe him. He agreed to ride back to Joan's house with him early Monday morning before work. They had left the front door open in their haste to leave, and he was afraid animals or vandals would have gotten to the house. 
When they arrived, the house looked like a tornado had gone through it. The couch was upside down. They had a large, heavy console TV, and it was apparently thrown across the room, laying in a spray of broken glass. The kitchen was trashed. The refrigerator knocked over and food everywhere. The doors to both of the boys' rooms were left closed, and the rooms were untouched, same as the bathroom. The master bedroom was torn apart. The pillows ripped up and feathers everywhere. The chest of drawers was knocked over, and the large mirror smashed. John's brother looked around in awe and said, You better call the police. John looked at him and said, And tell him what? Bigfoot destroyed my house. They left and closed the front door this time and drove to my dad's mill in Aberdeen. John's brother waited in the car while John went in and told this to my dad. After he was done, my dad said, Well, let's go have a look at it then. They drove back out to the house and John showed my dad the damage. He pulled the clump of hair from his shirt pocket and let my dad look at it. As they were walking through the house, surveying the damage, my dad pointed out cracks in the ceiling where it had apparently stood up and hit its head. John told my dad that they couldn't live there anymore, even if the creature was gone. They would always be afraid. Their homeowner's insurance wouldn't cover the damage. The adjuster claimed John must have done it in a drunken rage. My dad helped them find a place in Aberdeen and gave him a loan for new furniture and stuff. The house was eventually fixed up and sold, and my dad never heard about another problem there. A few observations about this story. My dad lost contact with John and his family in the mid-80s. They moved out of state, and my dad hasn't heard from them since. His brother died around the same time. Why didn't they call the cops? John had a lot of pride as well as a lot of common sense. He knew he couldn't logically explain what had happened to the authorities, and he didn't want the story to get out and have him branded a nutcase. I asked my dad if they saved the hair. He said John never mentioned it again, and my dad never asked him about it. I asked my dad if he saw the footprint and muddy fingerprints. He said he did. He said it looked like a giant barefoot man had stepped very carefully in the center of the mud. He's not a tracker, but he said it was the clearest print of any kind he had ever seen. I asked my dad if the neighbors had heard any of this. He said if they did, none of them ever mentioned it again. I also asked him if he thought it was possible John had made it all up. That he had trashed his house in a drunken rage and made up this elaborate cover story. My dad said John and his family were terrified of that place. They didn't even want to go back and get their clothes. If it was just an elaborate story, what did he stand to gain? To profit from a story in any way? You have to share it with people. My dad and the other folks mentioned in the story are the only ones who ever heard it. Until now, of course. He also said that whatever trashed that house was no man. The TV had to have weighed close to 200 pounds, and it was obviously thrown across the room with great force. He said that even after two days, there was still a wild animal smell in the house. I asked him if thought there might have been two creatures involved, considering the incident in the barn. He said he asked John that same question, and was told that Joan felt there was only one, that it lured him into the barn, then snuck out the side door to the house. The thing he thought he heard in the hayloft was either his imagination or some common animal like a raccoon. For whatever reason, this critter seemed focused on their four-year-old son. Their son was the only one who never showed any fear of it. He seemed to think of it as his friend. And although the sex of the animal was never determined, it was referred to as a male because of the predatory stalking type behavior. That and the conspicuous lack of breasts, or perhaps it was just not as well endowed as the Patterson film subject. Anyhow, its behavior almost seems indicative of a mother that has lost her little Bigfoot and is looking for a replacement. I rather facetiously asked my dad if little Timmy was a particularly hairy child, perhaps suffering from that rare condition that causes uncontrollable hair growth all over the body. He said Timmy was a normal little boy with normal brown hair on his normal head. I didn't ask if Timmy regularly reeked of rotting garbage and wet dogs. Didn't seem a polite course for the conversation to take. 
He told me of other possible Bigfoot encounters he and his crews had in the woods around Gray's Harbor. None of them are quite as titillating as the cowman story, but interesting nonetheless. Perhaps I'll share them if there is an interest here in them. So in the end, I was left with no leads to follow, no new evidence of anything. But I did come away with a pretty damn good story. And I guess that's better than a poke in the eye with a filthy and crusted hypodermic needle. Those of you who actually read this far, I give you a big thumbs up. You are truly an ardent and stoic follower of all things Bigfoot, or like me, recently underemployed and in desperate need to fill the endless, empty hours of your life. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.